meeting to order and can I welcome everyone to this, the 17th meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2018. Can I please remind everyone present to turn their mobile phones and other devices onto silent for the duration of the meeting. We have um, apologies which we received from the convener, James Doran, which explains why I'm in a powerful position I am today. Um, and delighted to welcome Claire Adamson as James Doran's substitute. The first item of business, a declaration of interest following a change of membership on the committee. May I welcome Gordon MacDonald to the committee and also take this opportunity to thank Ruth Maguire for her valuable contribution to the committee's work. Can I invite Gordon MacDonald to declare any relevant interests? I have no relevant interest to declare. Okay, thank you very much for that. If we can move to agenda item two, which is to allow the committee to agree whether to take today's review of the evidence and its inquiry into young people's pathways in private. Are members content to take this review and future reviews of the evidence in private? Okay. The substantive item on today's agenda is our first evidence session on young people's pathways. The basis for this inquiry includes a survey of 900 young people that provided detail on their experiences of considering which options to pursue in a senior phase of school and beyond. The committee agreed, based on the survey responses, to hold a short inquiry into progress made against two recommendations made in 2014 by the Commission for Developing Scotland's Young Workforce. These recommendations relate in the main to the provision of vocational pathways and careers guidance in the senior phase of school. Today we'll hear from one panel of witnesses from organisations involved in the delivery of these recommendations. In future weeks, we will hear from City and Wood, and then from Education Scotland and Skills Development Scotland, which are key delivery agencies on these recommendations. We will then hear from the Minister for Employability and Training. Less formal work to inform the inquiry will include a delegation from the committee visiting Shetland next week. In addition, the convener held a focus group with the Young Women Lead Programme last week to hear their experiences. And I would like to thank the young women for sharing their personal views to inform the committee's work and a write-up of the discussion is in paper too. Can I welcome to this meeting Michael Cross, Interim Director of Access, Skills and Outcome Agreements, Scottish Funding Council, Ewan Duncan, Professional Officer, Scottish Secondary Teachers Association, Jackie Galbraith, Vice Principal, Strategy and Skills, Ayrshire College and representing College of Scotland, Alison Henderson, Chief Executive of Dundee and Angus Chamber of Commerce and representing Scottish Chamber of Commerce Network. Terry Lanigan, representative of the Association of Directors of Education in Scotland, and Dr Jill Stewart, Director of Qualifications Development, Scottish Qualification Authority. Now, given the size of the panel and the size of the committee, we, are, um, we have a logistical challenge apart from anything else today. I thought it would be useful, um, given you all have very distinct roles um, in developing the young workforce, if you could each very briefly um, set out your organisation's role and think about the one thing that you must, you really feel you want to say to the committee in case we don't manage to get to it through all the range of questions that we're going to be asking you today. So there's one, you know, what you, what you do and one core point, I think that would be helpful. And when we go through to, go to the questions, it will not be necessary for everybody to answer every question. So I appreciate time um, would not allow that. So if we can maybe just start from Jackie Galbraith and move our way around. Hi. Um, I first of all, I'd like to say I welcome the opportunity to give evidence to the committee on behalf of Colleges Scotland. I work at Ayrshire College, and Ayrshire is a region that has significant challenge in terms of in the economy, employment, and providing opportunities for, for young people. And developing the young workforce and all of the policy that sits around that is, is a critical um, ambition in terms of enabling young people in Ayrshire to have positive futures. In terms of um, the, the college's role, we work in partnership with schools, with the Developing the Young Workforce Regional Employers Group, with the local authority, with the Chambers of Commerce and with employers to make sure that young people from at all stages in school, including from primary, have exposure to what colleges do and vocational opportunities. And I suppose the, the one burning point I would want to make is the, criti the critical role of partnership, shared ambitions and shared goals of all of those partners in achieving the very ambitious aims of the DYW agenda. Uh, good morning. Uh, I also welcome the opportunity to, to be here. ADES, uh, obviously, uh, is a membership organisation, but we have officers in every part of the country, every local authority uh, who have 
frontline responsibility for delivering in partnership with colleges, schools and others and employers, obviously, um, the DYW agenda. Um, I have been a member of the Developing the Young Workforce Programme Board since its inception and ADES is fully committed to what is a very ambitious agenda. I think the one thing that I would want to stress is that we are just past the halfway point in a seven year programme. It's a seven year programme of significant ambition and if the aims of the DYW programme and, uh, uh, are achieved and the recommendations in the Wood Commission report are overtaken, we will have successfully transformed Scottish society. The uh, relationships between schools, employers, colleges and the preparedness of our young people for the world of work. This is an agenda that Scotland has been struggling with all the time that I've been involved in education. And I think for the first time we are seeing real progress towards achieving the goals. Um, on behalf of the Scottish Chambers Network, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to come and give evidence. Um, we are, as a network, a strong supporter of the Developing Young Workforce Initiative, and the majority of chambers are involved and heavily engaged in the delivery through those regional DYW groups. Um, it is a national priority of ours to help engage employers into the, the young people in education, but also to bring them into work at an early stage with employers. Through engagement with Chambers, it's clear that there's a positive increasing momentum throughout DYW activity, and foundation apprenticeships are one that is beginning to bubble away. Levels of engagement and with employers and local authority partners continue to improve. We recognise there's a lot of proactive work being done with agencies, and the partnership working is absolutely key to delivering this as, a, as a, an agenda that we've all bought into. Um, what we would like to see is increased consistency of delivery um, and practical issues such as timetabling and transport, in addition to broader challenges around perception, are some of the issues that we've highlighted. But there are some really good practices going on that we can learn from. A key barrier to overcome, um, we must drive the uptake of those senior phase pathways. Um, and I'd like to see sustained independence of the regional groups, which continue to support all that work that's been done in partnership. Um, we're delighted to see such employer engagement uh, and, and helping to grow it. Thank you very much for the invitation to be here today. Uh, my name is Ewan Duncan. Um, I am a professional officer with the SSTA, which is a professional association and uh, a trade union representing teachers in Scottish secondary schools. Uh, prior to taking up my role as a professional officer, I was a guidance teacher for a number of years. Uh, and the point I would like to make is that secondary teachers, and particularly guidance teachers, I think, are at the heart of developing the young workforce in schools. And the SSTA would welcome a long-term commitment to help add time and guidance staff to secondary schools. There's a, a risk, I think, that too much of a focus on learning simply for work can reduce its value and diminish its impact. The challenge in schools is to prepare young people who are versatile and resilient, compassionate and risk-aware, communicative and honest, and most of all, ready for the uncharted territory that lies ahead of them. The best schools are strong teams where the focus is on the whole child, not simply the future worker. And unfortunately, reductions in school leadership, reductions in local authority leadership, reductions in support in schools, such as school nurses, the removal of homeschool link workers, the removal of pupil welfare officers responsible for attendance, all these reductions and removals mean that those teams around the child are shrinking and less able to provide the kind of focus required to make developing the young force recommendations a reality. Now, while money may not be the answer, people and time are certainly necessary to help prepare young people who are well-rounded and broadly educated. Thank you. Good morning, committee. I'm Jill Stewart from SQA. Um, our role is to provide, um, as you know, or as you well know, school qualifications, the national courses, but we also have a much broader remit to provide vocational qualifications. SQA offers over 1,400 vocational qualifications, um, and last year there were 160 odd thousand enrolments for those vocational qualifications, and 122,000 people achieved different types of vocational qualifications. The nature of those qualifications um, varies depending on the point that a learner is in in their journey throughout their life. So we have qualifications which are 
appropriate for younger people um, entering into um, employment or considering a particular route into employment. We have vocational qualifications for those who are progressing through their vocational careers, through perhaps an apprenticeship training programme or a programme at college, national certificate or HNCs or HNDs. We also offer a wide range of workplace competence qualifications called SVQs. We offer over 500 of those which support the modern apprenticeship programme. Um, and um, there are over 35,000 people achieve SVQs in 2017. In particular, around the, um, the DYW agenda, we've worked very closely with Skills Development Scotland to assist them in the development of the new foundation apprenticeships at SCQF Level 6, and we've worked with the relevant industry partners to do that as well. Um, so that, that has been a very positive development. We are also working with the STS who are considering whether or not there's a need for further pre-apprenticeship type programmes at SCQF levels four and five to cater for a broader range of young people who might not be at the level for entry into foundation apprenticeships. We also have a big team of regional staff who support both schools individually, um, but also um, regional staff who work um, with the regional DYW groups, with local authorities and schools to help them to understand what type of qualifications might be appropriate to support learners within their region. Um, we keep these qualifications up to date um, by um, constantly reviewing if things are changing in particular industries. Um, we work with key employers within Scotland um, to do that, and um, we very much pride, are very proud of the vocational portfolio that we have on offer. Also important to this agenda is the range of soft skills type qualifications that we offer to support the broader skills that you and made reference to that are very important for young people entering the world of work. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, good morning, convener and, and committee members. Thanks very much for the opportunity to represent uh, the SFC at this morning's session. Um, very briefly, we are the organisation that supports, challenges, funds Scotland's colleges and universities. Uh, we do so in line with strategic guidance that the Scottish Government provides us on an annual basis. In the Developing Young Workforce Programme, our role is essentially to um, work with other partners and use our own outcome agreement regime to support colleges in growing vocational provision. Um, if I were to leave one message with the committee, it's essentially to repeat that that Jackie gave. We ran a session for various partners at the turn of the year to examine successes and challenges in DYW and the, solu with the solutions, uh, uh, the consensus view was very much that this is a partnership effort demanding collaboration at every point in the system. Thanks. For that, and I think that was a, a useful um, capturing of the, the breadth of expertise we have in front of us. I want to ask specifically about um, the, the KPIs 10 and 11. Um, Stephen McCabe from COSLA, Council Stephen McCabe's COSLA Education, said that despite some of the progress made in, in the DIYW programme, I'm clear that we've simply not made enough progress in relation to addressing equalities issues relating to gender, disabled and care experienced young people. Before I do ask you specifically about that, I wonder if you have a view, a note that one of the things that regards great progress is the levels of youth unemployment. I wonder if, um, to what extent you have in your organisation looked at a definition of a positive destination, because I am concerned that some positive destinations are actually zero hours contracts with very little guaranteed work, very little training and very little um, opportunity for career progression. And I've raised this with the Minister and I wonder if you have a view on how we might define a positive destination to exclude that kind of very insecure and I would regard as exploitative work. I don't know who wants to kick off. Yep. Happy to, to sort of, uh, as an employer and as someone that works with over 650 businesses in Dundee and Angus, um, I would say that the positive destination 
statistics are something that I've long felt um, would warrant a closer look. I guess my point of view would not be that I'm, I'm hearing so much about the zero hours contracts, although in certain industries that is definitely a challenge, but um, we've heard from young people who have bounced through various training programmes that would have been classed as positive destinations, but they are bouncing through these and not, they're not leading to college, to an apprenticeship, to um, a, an actual job. Um, and so, yeah, I would I would echo what you've said. In terms of the, the gender or the looked after children scenarios, we have in Dundee and Angus have an apprenticeship ambassador programme and that is going in and talking to S3 pupils about all sorts of different um, imbalances and it's beginning to really bear fruit. So before young people at S3 age met with any of these apprenticeship ambassadors, many of whom are girls, they're, they, they're um, thoughts of being an apprentice or, or even knowing about apprenticeships were very poor and the, the stats go from 37% to over 75% of them keen to be an apprentice and look at different career paths. Does anyone just want to say something specific about the definition of positive um, in, um, destinations before I go on to really this more general question about equality? If I could just say very briefly, uh, as a guidance teacher, if a pupil came to me saying that they were considering moving into employment, I'd be asking them questions about uh, this, this particular employment you're thinking about. Does it offer training? Does it offer career progression? Are there some kind of qualifications that will be... Uh, underlying this work that you're going to be doing. Uh, I think uh, if we're going to think about positive destinations, particularly careers, we need to think about jobs which actually offer some kind of training, progression, qualifications, not the zero-hour contracts where you go in and wash dishes uh, when the employer needs you, but something which actually gives you the opportunity to develop as a person. Yeah, OK. Can I then maybe specifically ask on two um, key performance indicators and six... Um, incre increase the percentage of employers recruiting young people directly from education to 35% by 2018. And in fact, there's been no change. The figure remained at 32% between 2014 and 2016. And the second one, um, which is key performance indicator 11, increased positive destinations for looked after children by four percentage points per annum, resulting in parity by 2021. And it says here that's not met. The number of looked after children in positive destinations was 71.2% in 2015-16, a total increase of 1.9 percentage points since the baseline figures were recorded in 2012-2013. What do we need to do in both of these areas to um, see some more progress? Jackie? I think the, one of the critical things here is, is how we work with employers. Um, and, and in the region that I work in, there are significant challenges in the economy in terms of jobs that are available for young people who are leaving education. But the employers that we work with have been much more proactive about how they deal with that. So, for example, last night we had the ceremony for our found, first cohort of foundation apprentices in engineering in one of the companies there, GE Caledonian in Presswick. Um, they're taking a really proactive approach to working with young people from early secondary, in fact, from primary right through the school with the college to identify talent. So in the process of, of recruiting modern apprentices from the college and in supporting foundation apprenticeships, and they've actually offered a full-time job and a modern apprenticeship to one of the foundation apprentices who um, was successful in, in last night. And a, a further two foundation apprentices have got full-time apprenticeships now at UTC. And all of the others are now doing HNC, aeronautical or mechanical engineering courses at college, all positive destinations. But the critical thing is the employer's spot talent at an early age. For, he met a, young, a first year pupil, a young woman, um, at an event that they were doing, an awareness raising event in schools, and spotted that that young woman had the skills and the aptitudes to work in that industry, and they'll be working with her as she goes through school to try and encourage her to, to take a career in that particular company. So I think the key thing is about how we work with employers to identify that talent and to overcome these barriers, whether they are gender-related or other equalities issues. And, and the final thing I would say about um, care experience young people, it's critical that when care experience young people come through school and into college, that they're fully supported to sustain their college course, which will absolutely help them sustain employment when they, when, when they reach the end. And that's, a, that's an area that Ayrshire College has been really committed to, has been really proactive in, and we've seen significant improvements in the attainment and the retention of our, of our students who are care experienced because we have targeted that support and, and supported them through their, their college, um, college programmes. So I think that's really critical with the employer engagement there. Except it's not reflected in the figures. So does well, that mean that you're an outlier and you're doing stuff that other people aren't doing, or is it simply not coming through the process yet? 
Well, it may be back to the point about we're halfway through the programme and there's still time to go about the, the, you know, the figures um, being reflected. Because, again, it's a long-term programme and, ta and tackling gender imbalance in key industries, that's not something that's going to happen in two or three years, which is why we work with primary schools and we have a 1,000 young people over the next two weeks coming to the college to engage with employers on STEM-related activities. So we're investing that time and energy now, but we won't see the benefits of that until about four or five years down, down the line. Um, I think in relation to KPI 6, um, we have to remember where we started from. Um, the, Wood, in the Wood Commission report made reference to the fact that employers in Scotland had got out of the habit of recruiting directly from schools. So we were starting from a very low base. Now, while we have fallen slightly short of the target that, uh, that is referred to in KPI 6, we have made progress, and I think that there are a couple of things that will really make a difference here. Uh, the employer-led regional groups, which were a key uh, recommendation of the, uh, the, the Wood Commission, um, have got a very big role to play here. Now, they have been set up, they are now all uh, operational, but some of them have only been operating for quite a short time. So I believe that they will have a key role in increasing the engagement of employers um, with uh, this agenda. I also believe that the second thing, which uh, Alison made reference to earlier, uh, that will make a difference is the, the, the growth of foundation apprenticeships, which of course uh, uh, require schools and local authorities to work with colleges and employers directly to deliver these. Now, um, I think I made reference in my uh, submission that uh, ADES, uh, along with uh, Skills Development Scotland, is uh, holding a, a national uh, event on the 29th of August uh, on foundation apprenticeships, where what we will be trying to do is to exemplify the best practice that's out there just now and to address the issues that still exist, issues of retention, um, issues of timetabling, issues of perception of the, 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 the foundation apprenticeships among uh, parents and among young people. Um, so there are a number of things that I think uh, are in train just now, which will have a big impact in terms of the engagement of, of employers over the next year or two. Okay, Michael Cross. You've heard from both Terry and Jackie on the operational realities of the position, particularly in regard, I suppose, to care experience young people. From the perspective of the Funding Council, um, we operate on a series of um, outcome agreements that we develop with both colleges and universities over the course of a year, which defines, uh, in short, what the state gets for its investment by way of outcomes. It's important, therefore, I think, that we reflect the points that you're making in our outcome agreements, and indeed we do target improvements in attainment for care experienced people, for care experienced young people, uh, for those suffering from disability, and for those who suffer economic disadvantage. So I think we need to have that strategic, strategic framework properly in place to support the activity uh, that Jackie and Terry are describing on the ground. Thank and we have, we have done that. Alison Henderson? of practical things. So you could be looking at specific partnerships um, that the DYW teams could put in place with um, schools that particularly look after um, care experienced young people. Um, and we have some successful partnerships that are maintained in, in our schools. Um, uh, there is something about the, the guidance and the support that young people get when they're looking at university as opposed to looking at some of the other routes and we could be um, more proactive in terms of supporting young people to think about direct employment routes and apprenticeships. The, the, the description of foundation apprenticeships has been difficult for some parents and young people to get their heads around and that's been um, a, a a definite challenge um, and I think uh, as we measure schools on exams and, and other measures like that it can be counterintuitive to what we're trying to do from a, an outside perspective into helping the schools be able to direct resources to this and that's what's needed is, is direct committed resources to support the young people to look at these opportunities. Okay, yeah, I was really struck by the, the, the point about foundation apprenticeships because having taught standard grade it was difficult for me to separate that off from the very good young people who came through foundation and had still had aspirations to other things, but it was seen as a very different kind of qualification in the, the level that hires that. Um, Claire Adamson. Hey, thank you, convener. Um, hey, I just want to put on record that I'm actually the vice chair of um, CERC 
um, which may be relevant to our discussion this morning. But the, the, the thing I really wanted to get to is, is in terms of KPI 6, obviously they would commission, I mean, uh, to, um, I think 16 recommendations for employers to come on board. And um, it, it, if that engagement, however successful it is for engineering companies in your area and whatever, it, is there any um, analysis being done of sectoral challenges about getting into particular sectors like the IT industry, like um, some of the emerging businesses in biomedical sciences? Um, and, and just what you see are the challenges in increasing the number of employers that are actually engaging in the process? Jackie? Uh, can I answer that? But if you don't mind, could I just maybe say something about the disabilities thing first? It's just um, one of the things that develop in the Young Workforce Regional Group in Ayrshire does, along with the college and other partners, is it holds seminars for employers to raise awareness with them about, and what works with the Scottish Commission on Learning Disability about the benefits of employing young people who've got disability and what support there is available to do that. And they've done that now for a series of, of events over, over, the, over the past couple of years. So I think that's really important. Um, on your point about um, the challenges getting into different sectors, uh, I think that is a challenge. And for example, in, in Ayrshire, we know that there's a burgeoning um, industry in Glasgow and the surrounding areas and, and other parts of Scotland in terms of digital. And we've offered the digital, some of one of the digital um, foundation apprenticeships, and we hoped, hoped to offer them both this year. But there has been challenges in terms of the number of employers in Ayrshire who are, that are digital employers. So in terms of that, the young people in those foundation apprenticeships getting the access to the high quality work experience that need, we have a challenge because that particular industry is not well represented in Ayrshire. Now we're using different means to achieve that by inviting employers from other parts of Scotland to come and speak to young people and to, have, to give them other experiences. But it is a challenge and I think it does depend on the regional economy and where you, where you are. Yep. Thanks, John. I just wanted to comment on the digital. Um, yes, they're right. There are regional challenges, but there are also good examples of good partnerships with employers to offer digital opportunities. Dundee and Angus runs such a partnership um, with Code Academy um, using MPAs in software development. And there's also the work, I mean, there are other kind of examples around the country. And there's also the work that we've done with um, Code Clan around kind of higher level professional development qualifications and software development. Um, there's also uh, new developments, as there always a, is in digital, around um, cyber security. And we're also looking at the whole area of data science to kind of broaden out the range of pathways in that key industry for Scotland to grow economically, the digital industry. So challenges, but there's some successes and I suppose it really does depend on the opportunities within your area. Yes. The, the key to this really is, is that there isn't a, a one-size-fits-all solution to this because the, the, the labour market in different parts of the country varies significantly. Uh, if, you're in a, uh, you know, a, if you're a big city, then it's likely that you'll have major players in the private sector who are employers there and employee, employers of very significant numbers. I myself was, was Director of Education in Western Bartonshire, where the biggest employer by far was the council, followed by the NHS. And you had a couple of medium-sized uh, companies, but most uh, employers in the area weren't just SMEs, they were one and two people uh, oper operations. And there is a significant challenge in getting that sort of uh, organization to uh, engage with this process. And they have to, it has to be seen as a benefit to the, um, to the employer as well as to the young person. And I think that's the trick uh, that we haven't quite managed yet in, in engaging that part of the uh, of the of the Scottish economy. Okay. Uh, yep. I think it's also important to look slightly earlier in the process. You know, young people. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at the Celsius report from June 2017, and it notes that looked-after children with the most positive outcomes are those who are in foster care 
while in other care settings, those with fewer care placements in the year and those who have been looked after for the whole year rather than just part of it. So, you know, we're, we're looking at the kind of end process here, but I think we need to look earlier into a child's education and see how well are we actually catering for these young people when they're being cared for. Uh, how can we improve that part of it so that when they're ready to move on into employment that they are more fit for it, if you like, rather than maybe experiencing some of the chaos that they might have had through differing care settings earlier on in their lives. Okay, thanks. Mary Fee, briefly. Thank you, um, convener. I was, I was struck by a point that Terry Lanigan's just made about the, the, the difficulty with SMEs that have only got maybe one or, one or two um, members of staff. How difficult is it in, in rural areas for employers to engage, for example, with foundation apprenticeships then? Um, I think that there are very specific challenges in, in rural areas. And again, I think that the, the, the employer-led regional groups have a, a, a real job here to, to do in terms of the engagement with, uh, with uh, rural uh, employers. I personally have never worked in a, in a rural area, so I don't have direct experience, but I know from talking to colleagues that there are very particular challenges mm -hmm. uh, in, in rural communities. Um, and in particular, uh, one of the challenges that's been highlighted to me is that, that um, some communities are significantly distant from the nearest mm. college. Now, there are technological solutions to that, which uh, uh, the um, Western Isles in particular uh, have taken on board. Um, but th there's no doubt that there are specific challenges in rural areas. Mm. MacDonald? Um, you've, you've talked about how difficult it is for small companies to take people on in the vast majority of private businesses in Scotland are less than five employees. So I understand the difficulties, but why do you think it's the likes of hairdressing firms take on 900 apprentices a year uh, or have 900 apprentices? And, you know, they usually are one or two men business. Um, and yet other, or is it about mindset? Is it about changing the mindset of of small employers more than anything else? I think it is, although I would have to say I'm not an expert on hairdressing. No, you're saying, but um, <laughs> but I, I, do, I, I'm, I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't have the answer to that, to be honest. I don't know why hairdressers are more proactive in this agenda than others. Perhaps others do. OK, Alison? I, I don't know if I, I, I could surmise about the hairdresser issue that it may be that it's an easy qualification and then there's a route in there that's quite straightforward. So... Our chamber are a small business. We've only got eight employees. We're taking on a digital apprentice, but it's been difficult to work my way through the, the frameworks and work out what am I actually going to train that young person in. If it's, you know, a hairdressing, it's quite straightforward. Um, with our DYW area, we have got the region, we've got the city, but we've got the rural area. We're not finding it difficult to get small employers engaged in this agenda at all. Um, and I think where found where apprenticeships work well is where it's on the job learning so actually you're not necessarily tying that young person's training to a physical space in a college but it's connected to their school and it's connected to the employer who often is very close to that school anyway um, we've got 48 strong partnerships across our whole secondary school remit in Dundee and Angus and the a bigger problem is transport for young people getting to an employer in some of the rural areas than it might be for them to get to their school or their college. I'm, I'm not sure if the hairdressers out there who watch this would be happy for their job to be described as easy. <laughs> um, I think the, the challenge of trying to end with my hair would probably suggest it's <laughs> beyond most of us. Um, and I think there's a, a, a broader issue sometimes about hairdressers and those kinds of businesses. They actually are businesses. And they're sustainable businesses and they, they can be quite important in the high street and so on. But anyway, I think Jill Stewart wants to go in and then we're going to move yeah. on to the next Dan, I just section. Want, I wanted to comment on this, well, the traditions, I think, of different industry and, and where they've traditionally got their, their kind of workforce from. And I, I suppose it's kind of relating it to the hairdressing point. I think there's a tradition in, in that industry of taking people on and training them in the workplace, maybe using a training provider or, you know, to, to help with different skills development and knowledge development. So that's a kind of tradition that's strong in that industry, I think. But, but there would be different traditions in different industries, you know. So construction is very much about apprenticeships and kind of, you know, a bit of college training provider support, but on-the-job development, um, a strong programme. Engineering, whereas engineering, some apprenticeships, but much more about 
HNCs, HNDEs taking on people from degree programmes. So I think it's about mm -hmm. trying to change mindsets of employers about the benefits of bringing young people into their businesses at an earlier stage. It gives you an opportunity to um, work with that, you know, those young people, see see what they're like, actually see some of the talent that is there in our young people, and it can actually be, you know, really kind of enlightening for employers and open their eyes. I know we have our own apprenticeships within SQA, and we have some wonderful young people who have come in through that route, some of them being care experienced as well. So. Thank you. Can we move on then to senior phase vocational pathways? Ross Greer. Thanks, convener. Um, on the uh, vocational pathways within the senior phase, there's about a dozen local authorities in Scotland who have that as an option within 100% of their schools on paper. Now, we'll get to what that means in, in practice in a minute, but to look at the other end of the scale first. In Orkney, it's 20%. In Fife, it's just under 40 In Argyll and Butte, it's 40%. Um, now, accepting what we've just discussed around geographical challenges, though they're not absolute barriers, in Shetland, it's, it's 70%. The Western Isles has already been mentioned. What progress is being made, given that we've already discussed being halfway through, what progress is being made in these areas where actually only a very small proportion of the young people in these schools have this as an option? Terry? Um, I, I was struck by that table, and I think that there's possibly a flaw in the question. Uh, and the, if you look at that table, it says, for instance, that 60% of schools in Western Bartonshire only um, are involved with this agenda with colleges. I know that that's not the case. I know it's 100%. But the difference is that having invested very significantly in school buildings, a lot of the vocational space is now within the schools itself. And so it's delivered by college staff in the schools. But that's not what the question asks. The question asks about uh, delivery in college. So I think maybe there's, there are further questions to be asked about that particular table. OK, Jackie, go brief. Yeah, I, I had similar questions about that table. For my, I, my assumption is that table is based on senior phase vocational pathways in schools and not the, not the totality of what colleges and schools work on in terms of vocational pathways. So, for example, in, in my college, you know, 70% of the courses we deliver for school pupils are, are below SEQF level six. And that doesn't get counted in that table. So although some of the schools in Ayrshire may not be doing um, as much in the terms of the senior phase vocational pathways, they'll be doing significant amounts with us and other things. For example, with the DYW regional group and with Prince's Trust, we deliver 30 courses to half of the schools in Ayrshire on level SEQF level four. And that's really critical. It's really critical to, go, to get young people in S2 and S3 and S4 moving towards vocational pathways so that the senior phase and vocational pathways and senior phases is really open to them, and, and, and that's absolutely critical, and that's where we invest our time. So unfortunately, that table isn't really giving you the totality of colleges like my own, like Glasgow Clyde, like others. In fact, probably most colleges across Scotland about what they're actually doing. We've got, we've got staff who go into half of the schools in Ayrshire and work with S4s who are at risk of negative destinations, work with them in the school throughout the year to try and ensure they get a positive destination, and by and large they do by moving on to college or other things. So that doesn't get counted in this, and that's critical because we don't want foundation apprenticeships to be only available to those young people who would be achieving at SCQF level six anyway. We want young people coming through S1, S2, S3 to understand that there's these possibilities, and here are courses that are steps along the way. That you have around this issue would be really, I've got, really I've useful. Got figures, yeah. That would be really helpful. Okay, okay. Right. Right. Michael, I'd be interested in your point of view on this, in particular, given the SFC's responsibility for ensuring the collaboration happens. Is there more consistency across the country than that table would indicate? Yeah, I, th I think the point in particular, I think it's a footnote um, with three asterisks that <laughs> notes Jackie's point about the provision at sub SCQF level six. So there's a wide range, as Jackie um, has been saying, of provision that colleges are supporting schools to deliver that's not captured by this table. It's using SFC data, I think, to try and capture what is happening in, sc in school settings is quite difficult, and I think this is less than comprehensive, I would have to say. Um, and just to turn to what this means in practice for individual young people as opposed to an overarching school level, we receive a lot of anecdotal evidence of what you might call railroading, where uh, vocational options are nominally an option, but it has been decided long before the young person is informed that that is the option for them. It's less about giving the young people in the school a choice about what route they want to take, 
uh, and more that it's, it's essentially been decided for them. And again, there's inconsistency there and it's anecdotal. But I'd be particularly interested uh, for you and analysis, and I suppose, Jackie, for, from a college's point of view, is, is that the reality? Are, are we getting towards that point where these are genuinely options, choices for young people as opposed to something that's decided on their behalf? Having been heavily involved in the kind of course choice process for quite a number of years, at no point would I tell a young child, a young person, what to do uh, in terms of their choices. I would uh, advise them, I would encourage them, uh, but we would also speak to their parents as well. We would take into account what their career aspirations were, uh, what their achievements were to date, uh, and we would give them some quite reasoned. Uh, ideas about what they might consider choosing. It would also depend a little bit on what the entry qualifications were, what the opportunities might look like for them after that particular course. Um, they might feel they're being railroaded, but uh, perhaps what they're being given is strong advice, which would be, this would be a good choice for you, but there are other options. Uh, so I, at no point would I say that a young person would ever be railroaded into doing a particular course of study, but sometimes uh, they would be encouraged to think quite strongly about it. You mentioned parents. Are, are parental perceptions or invocational options changing? Do you think? I think so, yes. There's been a lot of work done in that uh, by the colleges and by schools. Um, my own children at school, they, um, the school frequently has information nights uh, where uh, you know, we, we can go in as parents to hear a little bit more uh, and there will be a representative there from Ayrshire College who will come in and speak to parents about what these courses look like, uh, what the foundation apprenticeships look like uh, and it's uh, kind of building up that body of information. I think what would be helpful would be to actually hear from some of the young people themselves who have been through the courses or have been through the apprenticeships both uh, for parents and for the young people too in classrooms, particularly when they're making option choices. Uh, that's something which we didn't manage to do when I was teaching, uh, partly because of a lack of time, uh, partly because it's sometimes quite difficult to identify who would be a good speaker. From time to time, we did manage to get school leavers to come in and speak to those making choices uh, to help inform them when they're making their decisions. But uh, the, the, the best advocates are often those who have experienced it themselves. Yeah. Um, I think a critical thing here is, is about communication and um, it's about what you know. So I think that, again, back to employers, if employers are advocating this and, and, and respected employers are supporting this, parents will come on board. And what we're doing with, with employers in Ayrshire is they're, they're actually giving of their apprentices time to do exactly that, to speak in schools, to meet parents and so on. But I think the really important thing for me is that, that in schools at the moment, I worry about the school leaver destinations and how they're portrayed because the reality is that most young people leave school and go on to college. But the way the school leaver destinations figures are reported is if most young people go into university. That's not the case. 40% oh, 40 of young people go into college. Some do higher education qualifications. Some do further education qualifications. And about 26% go straight to university. So for me, it's about helping teachers, helping parents, helping others understand that and understand that college is a route for many different and ways to, to get to where you want to get to and, and celebrating the validity at the early stage. And I think critical here is how teachers and lecturers, colleges and schools can share in professional development. We talked about it earlier, actually, in, in, the, in the cafe, to, to raise that awareness because many people who work in schools haven't had the experience of the college sector and don't know about the rich um, diversity of qualifications that Jill spoke to. And I think that's really critical to remember that the majority of young people at school don't go to university, straight to university and the colleges can help them get there. But more importantly, it can help those that choose not to go there achieve the aims that they want to achieve in life. Okay. Oliver Mundell. Thank you, convener. I wanted to stick uh, with uh, choice, but just looking at it from a slightly different angle, uh, do you feel that the sort of reduced uh, subject choices and pressuring on uh, the timetable uh, is, is pushing some vocational subjects sort of out of people's reach and making it practically difficult for them to pursue them? In the fence here a bit. Um, what the, the reduction in the number of subjects, and I, I must say I'm not a fan of that. I think uh, a broad education is very valuable, and I think the narrowing of subjects early on in a pupil's career hasn't been helpful. I, I think uh, that there are problems with that. 
but um, one of the advantages has been that schools have been able to align their timetables. Uh, and so you'll find that uh, in some parts, particularly in Ayrshire, um, we, we've got uh, colleges uh, offering school courses uh, on particular afternoons each week. And that means that young people, instead of maybe missing uh, some of their subjects that they've chosen to study uh, in school, uh, are able to know that, for example, a Tuesday afternoon is a college afternoon, a Thursday afternoon is a college afternoon, or it could be uh, used for volunteering or for work experience or for other purposes. So, you know, in some ways, uh, the reduction in options has enabled that synchronisation of timetables right across um, the, the whole of uh, Ayrshire uh, and with the college. But on the other hand, it is narrowing choice as well. And there are occasionally problems where you know a child perhaps wants to uh, do a particular college course, but uh, it's also perhaps their best subject for example, if they're choosing hires, uh, that's perhaps their best subject. They want to do a college course, but they can't also do their best hire. They're then stuck with trying to choose between the two. So there are issues there, yes. Terry? Um, I think we have to remember that uh, Curriculum for Excellence is predicated on a broad general education uh, up to the end of S3. And uh, while you might, it might look as if the choice is narrowing in the, the, the senior phase, if you actually dig a bit deeper, you find that that's not the case. Now, first of all, I think that there's, there's evidence in these papers that um, youngsters are not being denied the opportunity to get to follow vocational uh, qualifications because it's continuing to grow year on year, that both the number of courses and the number of youngsters accessing those courses. If the, 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 the problem wa was as you've suggested, then that would not be happening. I think the second thing is, the, and it's maybe building on a point that, that Ewan has just made, the advantage of having, if, if I think back to the age of standard grade, where you had, generally speaking, eight subjects in S4 and a maximum of five in S5 and S6, making a total of 18 overall. The most common uh, pattern now is six subjects in S4, although some do seven and some still do eight but then six subjects, up to six subjects in S5 and up to six subjects in S6 are possible in the timetable, making a total uh, of 18. But the advantage of having 666, not the number of the beasts, but you can, uh, having 666 as the pattern um, means that schools, and the increasing number of schools are doing this, can timetable S4 to S6 together, which actually increases the, the, the choice available because you can timetable uh, uh, across the, the, the different year groups. It makes uh, some courses uh, actually more viable because you get a, a greater number. Um, and it also, from the schools that are doing it, there's a report that the motivation and behaviour of S4 pupils has improved where they are actually in classes with, with fifth and sixth years. So I don't think it's, um, you know, the, the situation is as you described it. The other thing about, about uh, this is that by reducing the, the number in S4, you actually increase the possibility of youngsters accessing college because there's a bigger block of time for each subject. And in the, in the eight subject models, where typically you had three periods for a subject, it often wasn't possible to timetable a college course in S4. Can I ask one more yeah, question? Obviously interested in what you say. It doesn't seem to match up with the reality that pupils, certainly within uh, my own constituency, talk about. But that perhaps comes into some of the challenges in being in a more rural area. But surely you must accept that I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that people are getting more vocational opportunities. But it creates another problem at the other end for some students. I was recently uh, at the Roslyn Institute and in, in Vet School, and you know, they are matching up, what they're saying is matching up with what young people are saying, that they're not able to take then all of the academic subjects they need, if that's their choice. They're not able to take three sciences, for example, they're having to drop sciences and take crash hires uh, well, later on. Sorry, could I answer that? Um, first of all, it's not necessary to take three sciences in one year to go, to, to go into medicine or veterinary medicine. Um, Many schools do timetable for three sciences. It's easier if you're a bigger school, 
But the other factor here is the effective use of consortium arrangements, which uh, uh, allows for a wider choice. So you might not be able to do the three sciences in your own school, but you can do the third science along the road. Mm, with, with, with respect, again, that's far more challenging in rural areas where there's no access to transport. There are, uh, and uh, th these digital solutions that I hear you mention you know, have, haven't certainly arrived. Mm -hmm. There are also always going to be additional challenges in rural areas where schools are further apart. But let's remember that the, the choice in S5 and S6, where you're talking about the higher courses for these high tariff ten, subjects, ten has years not ago reduced. Those ten years ago, those choices were there, and now they're not. OK. I think we might be interested in what actually happens at a stage when people are competing for places at university, whether having three sciences is an advantage and it makes it more likely that you're going to secure a place when there's a, a reduction. But that's maybe a discussion for another time, I'm, I'm afraid. We're, we don't want to... Um, we have quite a lot to get through, but there's some things we need to do more pop at the end, and if there's time, we will do that. Um, George Adam. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Uh, I would just like to ask, just follow on on the timetabling side of things, because when I was in the committee at the last session, we visited a school in Edinburgh, a secondary school that covered a, a, an area that had a, a cross of people from different demographics and poorer to uh, richer backgrounds as well. But they got to a stage where they had to think radically about timetabling. And they ha but it was only when they got to that very difficult stage where they said, you know, because parents weren't, they were trying to find other schools for their children to go to, that they had to actually make that decision and sit down with everyone, the teachers and everyone else, and say, we need to do something different here, we need to be radical. And they had a flexible timetable that worked around the local college and worked around the various courses and businesses as well with the uh, access that they had. So uh, how do we get ourselves to that place where we have that flexibility in school that gives that option to the younger person to be able to say, I want to do that hairdressing course. I want to be involved in that. In my case, you would go to West College Scotland and you would do that. How do we get to that place where you're already doing that in the senior stage? Yep. I, I would just follow best practice. So one of our schools in, in one of the really nicer parts of Dundee has done some really clever timetabling on a Friday afternoon to get their pupils to choose some electives around careers guidance, around practical skills and employment, and they've worked with the college going in, and they've done a barista academy, for example. So looking at some of the sectors that are prevalent in Dundee, hospitality, tourism, digital skills, um, the school has been very clever, but it's taken a lot of hard work by um, a teacher that just believes DYW is the thing that they should focus on, and he will then talk to other schools, but it's taken a long time for other schools to pick it up. Okay. Yep. George. Sorry, Michael. Michael. Yeah, thanks. Um, I said at the outset that um, the SFC, together with Scottish Government Learning Directorate officials, had convened a series of workshops around the course of the year to talk about DYW progress, um, successes and challenges. And um, timetabling featured both as a, success, as a success and a challenge. And we subsequently, and I'd like Terry to comment on what he thinks the outcome of this has been. We subsequently wrote together with government to two college partners and to local authorities to encourage them to explore the many areas actually where joint timetabling is working and see what lessons can be learned from that. So we've tried to create, once again I say, a strategic mandate to allow partners to collaborate in the way that, in such a way as to allow joint planning of both provision and timetabling. And I wonder, Terry, if you can say that has been working or not. I think uh, Mr. Adam uh, raises a real issue, um, but I think it's an improving situation. Um, essentially, what requires to happen um, is that timetablers need to change their mindset and head teachers need to change their mindset. The traditional approach to timetabling, especially in the, in the senior phase, is that you've basically, you offer a child, a young person, a menu, and you literally choose courses from each column um, and uh, if it doesn't if your choice doesn't fit that then tough now what when I was working with head teachers and, and timetablers I argued that that had to change and you had to start with the individual young person so you had to identify what they saw as being their plan for their journey through the senior phase and you had to look at how you could accommodate that 
And that involved not just the timetabling on your own, but talking to other schools, talking to colleges, and, and coming up with a system that, that could maximise uh, the choice for young people and maximise the number of young people who could get the choices that they wanted. Um, it's a challenge because it's a much more difficult approach to timetabling, but it is possible. And as Alison says, there are many good examples of this across the country where people often along with colleges, have ripped up the, the timetable and said, look, that is not fitting for this group of young people. This is what we need to do. I think it's about exemplifying good practice to make sure that that rolls out more, uh, more uh, consistently across the country. Yep, briefly, and then we're going to move on to the next section. You, you could also though, observe that from a guidance teacher point of view, that does add significantly to the, the work of the person who's supporting the young people making their course choices. Uh, and if we're going to do it like this, we perhaps need to look at how schools are resourced to enable them to be more flexible and to seek out these opportunities. Thank you. Just Very question. Briefly, yeah. It's basically before we had uh, UWS Principal uh, Craig Mahoney and, and he basically has talked about he was talking about university and it might be because of his institution's history that he comes from this perspective but he says a lot of his success stories aren't necessarily people who actually finished uh, higher education it's back to destinations again it was effectively people who ended up in a positive destination from university but ended up in a vocational side of things now that might be specific to that institution because of its history but is that not maybe another way of looking at flexibility as well of you know people going down one stream but then all of a sudden there is something else for them at the other side One of the challenges that we find as teachers is that uh, we, we nurture the young people through their six years or whatever of secondary education, and then they leave and we record their destinations. We don't really know what happens afterwards. And a lot of impact takes place in school, but we don't really know what that impact has been until many years later. Uh, and there's no way of tracking that. When I mean, you think about the different careers that people have in their lives uh, and the choices that they made in school, they, they perhaps would uh, have had particular things happen or choices made, but we don't know what impact that is. And to be able to reflect on that by knowing what's happened five, ten years after school might actually help teachers to inform their practice as they support young people. Right. We need to make some progress now, so can we move on? Uh, theme three, Foundation Apprenticeships. Um, Mary Fee. Um, convener and, and good morning, panel. Um, I, I'd like to um, ask the panel's um, view on the um, differing set of targets that have, of, that have been um, floated for um, foundation apprenticeships. And I want to just take you through the kind of timeline of, of figures for foundation apprenticeships. In 2016-17, the government guidance to SDS said there was no target. In 2017, they said, the government guidance said that during 2017-18, they would provide funding for 3,000 new foundation apprenticeships. In 2018-19, the government said they, were, they would um, fund 2,600 foundation apprenticeships in 18-19, and the SDS had supported 1,245 in 2017-18, and that would help towards the target of 5,000 by 2019-20. They then went on to say the target was 5,000 by 2019, and then in um, the guidance letter of 2017-18, it said 5,000 by 2018-19, and then went on to say it was 10,000 by 2020. Now, I am interested in the panel's view on the impact of those um, differing targets and what your understanding of, of the target is. Ted Lanigan. I'm quite clear as a member of the DYW programme board that the target has always been 5,000 by session uh, 1920. Uh, and I suppose that, that this that I can see that there are discrepancies in some of the figures that you've given, but I don't think that there's a contradiction between the target of 5,000 by 2019, because it's often measured by the entries, which would be 2019. So the, 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 the measurement is 5,000 entries to modern apprenticeships by 1920. Uh, I don't know uh, why the, 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 the other figures, uh, where the other figures have come from. The government say they would support 3,000 new foundation apprenticeships in 2017-18, um, and in actual fact, 1,245 were delivered. Have you a view on why there was a massive discrepancy in what was predicted and what was actually achieved? I think Michael was wanting to come in. I can't answer that question. Um, I think that's one that you'd need to put to mm. um, Can anyone answer that Scotland. question? 
Um, Jackie, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to offer a view from a practical point, point of view. Be, Michael talked to Ella on about outcome agreements for colleges, and part of those outcome agreements are about increasing, intensifying, I think is the, is the word that's been used, what we do with foundation apprenticeships, and we work really hard because we believe they are good qualifications, they're good frameworks for some young people. Um, my own view, and this is a personal view, is that foundation apprenticeships are, are, are brand new. And you know, introducing new qualifications is a huge task. And I know that from talking to parents, talking to employers, talking to the young people at school, that it takes a long time to, for them to understand this is a new, chunky and respected qualification. So what we're seeing in Ayrshire is always a slow start. As I said, our first cohort of engineering foundation apprentices were celebrated last night. That was a cohort of 10. Um, this, this, we've now got a current cohort of about um, 30 to 40 foundation apprentices. We, we plan to increase it next year. But these increases are based on what we can, we can achieve with the schools, with the, with the uh, amount of knowledge that's out there at the moment. So I suppose, I suppose from my point of view, they are very ambitious targets, but there's a practicality about, you know, if any of us remember around the table, I mean, I think there's some people of ages with me around the table, there have been many changes in qualifications over the years. And where people understand qualifications best is where they, they've sustained over a number of years. And what we have to do here is, is, is get to that point where foundation apprenticeships are sustaining over a number of years and then I think you'll see a significant increase in the numbers but I, I, I'm not able to comment on the inconsistency of, of the government's targets. Okay, yep. I think, I think that's part of the problem is that when these were being brought in, there was a, a kind of a, a lag of information about what level they would be at and, and what it would mean for employers and, and colleges working together to try and encourage the intake of these. Um, we are still seeing some real slow numbers in Dundee and Angus in terms of teachers talking about these as a qualification and encouraging young people in. So we've got a big education to do of parents, of teachers, um, and generally everybody to, to persuade. And also there's a, you know, it, would you take a foundation apprenticeship as opposed to a higher? There's, there are a whole bunch of, of, of conflicting things out there, I think, causing some problems. Okay, yep. A kind of comment. Um, Foundation apprenticeships require um, a work placement with an employer, and, and I think that takes time to establish in a, in a local area. And I think that that would probably be kind of underestimated at a national level how long some of those kind of partnerships would take to set up. And it's kind of moved at different paces and different different areas, different local authorities. You know, for instance, I was out last week speaking to. A local authority in the central belt and they were talking about strategically they now had partnerships with about 10 or 12 kind of local employers and um, clear kind of regional economic priorities in their area and and now they were putting in place the foundation apprenticeships and so on. so it it's best practice from across europe tells us that it's this combination of vocational skills with a significant kind of work placement with an employer that provides the best kind of vocational experience for young people and helps to make them successful, but they're not easy or quick to set up. So I think we've just underestimated, Scotland has probably just underestimated the amount of time um, that some of these take to set up, as well as the communication and engagement and, and because, as Jackie said, and. Alison have said there are new there are new qualifications, there are new programmes, so it takes time for people to say, Well, what is this? You know, if you've got a son or a daughter, you want to know, well, what is it going to do for them? Is that a good choice for my son or daughter to take, you know, and as parents we, we but these are good qualifications. They will they will give them credit into a modern apprenticeship. They will also give them broader understanding of the world of work and employability skills and the types of attitudes that are needed in work and so on. So, Then has the target perhaps been too ambitious to say 10,000 by 2020? Has that been too ambi ambitious given what you've said about the lack of understanding and, and, and the kind of base work that perhaps should have been done when the foundation apprenticeships were established? 
I think that's very, very difficult to provide. I think you have to set ambitious targets for, for, for people to aim towards. To do the, the kind of that partnership work and in yeah. collaboration yeah. with setting the figure, you have to ensure that everyone is on board and everyone understands what a foundation apprenticeship is and what it could lead to. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And when you, what you tend to see with adoption of new qualifications is things do start very slow. I'm a scientist, so I'm doing an exponential curve here. They do start very slowly until people understand what's it about. You know, the deliverers understand what what have I got to put in place and so on. And the end users, the, the young people and their parents and carers understand what's involved. So is it wrong to say ambitious targets? I, I don't think so. I think you know there's lots of steps being put in place to try and address some of the challenges. Um, I think it's good to have an ambitious target. Any views on whether it's an achievable target? Tenny? I think it can be. I think it is achievable. I think it's, it is ambitious, but I think, I think it is achievable. Um, and one of the, I mean, I do think that we've now got a situation that foundation apprenticeships are in every college region, they're in every local authority, they are offered by 70% of secondary schools. So we're reaching a critical mass and I made reference earlier to the conference that ADES and, and STS are holding in, in August. The aim of that is to try to take it to the next step where people see what the timetabling and other issues are and are willing to take on the challenge of it because I certainly believe that it's a, 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 an ambitious target but that it's one uh, worth trying for and I think it is achievable. Okay. Yep. Question, how were these targets actually arrived at? I'm not aware of any work having been done to identify the number of young people for whom they might be appropriate. Just going back to Ross's question earlier, I'd hate to find ourselves in a situation where we're shoehorning people into doing apprenticeships simply to meet targets. Far better that it is what young people uh, want to do and what's right for them and what's appropriate for them. Uh, and I think you know, we need to be careful about using targets uh, and not to let, allow the targets to lead our thinking, but to actually work out what's best for the young people. I suppose it's a boundary between ambitious and unrealistic, but sounding good. And I think that's <laughs> the test of it. Um, I think we need to move on. We're going to move on now to careers information guidance theme. Um, I'm going to ask Liz Smith first. Uh, thank you, convener. I wonder if I could uh, ask Mr. Duncan uh, a question about this uh, careers guidance. So is uh, Mr Greer earlier rightly referred to the fact that we have taken quite a lot of evidence from young people who don't feel uh, that some young people who don't feel that the careers guidance is very comprehensive and very uh, readily understood. And that's also a theme that was flagged up by Professor Jim Scott when he was looking at the subject choice issue and leaving that aside just now. Uh, one of the concerns that he had is that he identified that a third of schools um, he didn't feel we're meeting the Scottish Government guidelines through local authorities about what parents need to know. You mentioned earlier, Mr Duncan, that you felt one of the problems was um, difficulty of resourcing this in schools. C could you tell us, as somebody who's been experienced in the guidance sector as well as uh, in your present role, at what stage in school do you feel that we have to uh, make a really determined effort to give the youngster, uh, all the advice, the comprehensive advice that we're looking for, and what else do we have to do to ensure that they all get the information that allows them to make an informed choice and not being pushed in one particular direction? I think the, the issue here is that um, a lot of this falls onto the shoulders of the guidance teacher. And uh, the, the role of a guidance teacher is to get to know the young people in their caseload very well. Now, that can be quite a challenge when you've got a, a, a low number of guidance teachers and a large number of pupils. Uh, latterly, I was working with a caseload of upwards of 260. Uh, and you can imagine that that's quite a large number to get to know really well, along with their families too. Uh, and uh, the, the getting to know them process would actually start before they even came to secondary school. Uh, we'd begin in the transition process from primary seven, and we'd be speaking to the primary school teachers. And from that point onwards, we're, we're speaking to them regularly, we're advising them, we're encouraging them to think about careers and what might be right for them that there's a regular dialogue that goes on so there's no kind of uh, single point where you sit them down and say right it's time to make a decision about a career uh, you would only do that if it was getting to a, a point when you know they're very close to leaving school and there seems to be no de decision on the horizon but uh, it's not something which you would say right hard crunch we do this now 
at the beginning of fourth year or at the beginning of fifth year. It is something which has to be a regular focus of PSE all the way through secondary schools. And we need to guidance teachers who are well trained, who are well informed, who know what the options are out there, what the pathways look like. Guidance teachers are very busy people. We're not only focused on careers. Uh, there's a lot of crisis management goes on in secondary schools. Um, um, when it comes to UCAS, for example, one of the things that came out of the, uh, the, the report was that a lot of young people felt that uh, schools only focused on UCAS. Um, that may be an impression which they get, because I think uh, UCAS takes up a lot of our guidance teachers' time. I know in the months between uh, September and November, when uh, UCAS is at its uh, kind of peak, uh, you're spending hours and hours and hours supporting people thinking about applying to university. And the downside of that is that you've got less time to support other pupils in your caseload. I would argue that uh, what we actually need is to broaden out uh, the number of guidance teachers that we have in schools and to give them more time and better training uh, to, to enable them to offer careers advice frequently, regularly and effectively. Uh, thank you very much for that, uh, Mr Duncan. I, I think I entirely agree with what you've said. I think there are some people who uh, feel quite strongly that perhaps the, prime, the later years of primary school can be very important in addressing uh, the perceptions and addressing some of the ambitions and aspirations that young people have. Do you, do you have any suggestions about what uh, could be done to ensure that that's a better process in terms of opening up the world to youngsters in primary six, primary seven? I think... Uh this working. I think that there's real value in getting uh, people working with youngsters in primary school, not just uh, in terms of guidance, but right across the whole curriculum. Uh, I know some schools have been very imaginative, uh, where secondary and primary schools have collaborated, and uh, secondary teachers have gone to work with youngsters in primary schools, and primary teachers have come to experience what happens in secondary schools. I think that's a very worthwhile process to start uh, talking about careers uh, in the later years of primary school. I think be very valuable too. What does a, a college course look like? What does it mean to go to university? What is an apprenticeship, uh, you know, getting away from just a people who help us type approach to jobs uh, and careers advice, but actually uh, having, for example, representatives from SDS careers officers uh, going and speaking to young people uh, in the latter years of primary school, so they build that familiarity. One of the things which we uh, frequently encourage young people to do through secondary school was to self-refer to the careers officer. We also did some pretty proactive work in identifying who needed to be seen by a careers officer, but for young people to feel there's somebody they can pop in and and have a conversation with uh, in terms of getting good quality, uh, very focused and informed careers advice. I think that familiarity is important and it maybe needs to begin mm. quite early on. Mm. Could, could I just follow that point up? Mm. I, mean, I was on the same visit to the Roslyn Institute a couple of weeks ago, uh, which is doing outstanding work with uh, primary uh, children as well as secondary children. But the point, one of the points that was put to us by some members of staff is that some schools are unable to get their children to the Roslyn Institute because they are unable to afford the bus transport that's mm -hmm. required or whatever. Can I ask whether the SSTA is getting a lot of information fed back on that particular aspect of resource problem? Uh, we, we frequently hear from teachers about shortage of resources, uh, about uh, not, not simply about transport, but uh, just about basic things like paper and pencils and textbooks, that there are shortages uh, and you, know, you, you have to cut your cloth and you know, schools uh, have to make hard decisions at the moment. We are in a, a position where there is a resource shortage in all areas. Uh, and so you know, if you have to think about, right, do we pay for a bus to go somewhere or do we pay for uh, jotters or perhaps uh, IT that allows us to move forward with national testing, you, you have to make hard decisions in a school. My final question, convener, is to Dr Stewart. Um, Janet Brown, when she was here um, a couple of times in, in the recent uh, committee sessions, um, acknowledged that there have been some issues about the National Four qualification um, and that the recognition of that National Four qualification, both amongst parents and employers, is not particularly strong on a universal basis. I just wonder, have you got a comment to make about that National Four qualification just now, whether there's ongoing work uh, to, to look at it and whether in the light of the discussions we're having about other pathways, perhaps National Four should be reformed? National Four uh, is currently being considered by the government's uh, Curriculum and Assessment Board. Um, I think we have to think back to um, why National Four you know, the debate is around whether or not National Four should be internally assessed or externally assessed, and because it's internally assessed, then the kind of there's perceptions of, about its credibility and so on. So that's the kind of debate that's been 
that's been going on. Um, what, what the group has been doing is the Scottish Government has been gathering further evidence about stakeholders' views about National 4. So there was already a considerable body of evidence gathered from a variety of sources, from parental organisations. SQA did two rounds of fieldwork with schools. And the one at the end of 2017, um, whilst it asked the views of teachers and senior managers in schools what they thought about National 4, and the views were quite mixed. We did actually run focus groups with young people that were doing either National 4 only or a combination of National 4 and National 5. And the young people themselves um, said that they were quite, you know, and the majority of them were quite happy with National 4 being internally assessed. The Scottish Government has been gathering further views, it has gathered further parental views, and there are still kind of um, perceptions from parents about the credibility of, of National 4. Interestingly, the work with employers, um, employers um, were not concerned by the fact that National 4 was internally assessed, probably because employers are used to vocational qualifications, um, all of which are internally assessed and rigorously quality assured. So there's a kind of What's emerging is a kind of body of evidence about different stakeholders' perceptions and what the curriculum and assessment group, as I understand it, will be doing in June is to consider that kind of body of evidence about perceptions and think about a communication and engagement strategy with different stakeholders. But the ultimate decision on that would be the Scottish Government's uh, decision and the Deputy First Minister's decision. Okay, Gillian Martin. Okay, follow up on the in the question around careers advice, but I have to say, first of all, I'm quite concerned that young people's feedback was dismissed so quickly by, by you and Duncan when it came to, to, to UCAS firms, because in my experience as a former college lecturer, I often had uh, students coming to me saying that they felt that throughout their, their school life they felt pressured by their parents and their teachers that university was often the be-all and end-all and that college was often seen as a, a second choice and, th and I've certainly had feedback from, from young people, um, some of the MSYPs actually in a, in a forum that I um, uh, chaired that apprenticeships have um, a very long-standing, I suppose a, an old-fashioned perception amongst parents and teachers has been something that you did when you couldn't achieve anything else. And I think we need to uh, listen to young people's voices around that as well. So I'd, I'd like to ask the panel just how we can engage young people and parents in looking at these pathways in a way that they're equally valued. Peter Lanigan. I think that that's part, part of the challenge of the whole DYW uh, program um, and it's an historical thing in Scotland that uh, we have tended to value academic qualifications and university entry above all else and changing the culture is of anything is the most difficult thing to do one point about the feedback from young people and this uh, uh, I, I, because I I would argue that the situation is definitely improving and that that, that, that the balance is beginning to shift to more of a, uh, a an equal uh, view of, of vocational and academic qualifications. And one of the things that struck me about the SPICE um, survey was that 26% of respondents were over 21. Now, they will all have left school before the DYW programme started. Um, indeed, many of the, the youngsters in the middle category, the 29%, uh, will, will have left school either after it uh, started or in its first year. And only 36.1% of uh, the respondents are actually currently at school. Now, I would not dismiss the views of young people, and this is, uh, but I think we should be careful about interpreting these figures because actually the, some of the youngsters that were young people that were responding to this left school seven years ago so um, we have to take the lesson and we have to work hard at it and the only way to change people's perceptions is through exemplification through showing people that these uh, qualifications are valuable through getting young people who have been through modern uh, 
perhaps gone on to modern apprenticeships to come back into schools and to talk about uh, the, the value of that experience and of selling to parents the idea that these qualifications are not just for those who are not academic but are valuable for everyone because of the life skills that they, uh, that they involve. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Carry on. Thank yes. Just very briefly, I think, to echo a point that Terry made earlier, um, but to endorse what he said, more people are doing them. More young people are undertaking um, senior phase pathways. They're growing very quickly, um, delivered by colleges with schools. So more youngsters are taking up the opportunity. It's ancient to be dismissive of young people's views. Uh, what I was saying was that wasn't my experience that uh, in the work that I've been doing in school that we'd worked very hard to make everything equal and uh, level and certainly not to suggest that college qualifications were in any way inferior. There are different qualifications. Teachers are in the business of trying to encourage young people to get the best qualifications possible uh, and uh, as I was saying earlier, by getting to know them, we would hopefully get to a point where we can advise them and say, well, you know, think about this. Have you thought about university? But uh, at the end of the day, it has to be the young person's choice. Uh, and that has been my approach. Maybe it's been different elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Of this as teachers because we can do the education with the parents and with the young people but if teachers aren't bought in or, or, are, or are finding it inconsistent then they won't take that message. We've seen um, or I'd like to see more connection with teachers and the DYW activity in general because we do lots of support work and, and lots of project work with young people and often the teachers because they are stretched will go off and do something else rather than partake in that DYW activity so so that it could be exposing teachers to the world of work and to employers because many of them will have been teachers for a long time, have gone in through university and haven't experienced some of these new modern, um, some of the new um, roles that there are within businesses. And the other thing I would say is that um, we have inconsistencies in schools with DYW leads or DYW being bolted on to somebody's day job, and that's really not great because the DYW person in a school needs to be an influencer. So I would almost take that careers guidance and spread it broadly. Every single teacher should know that DYW activity inside out and should be able to talk about the broad range of future jobs that are and the skills that are needed for that and have the DYW person be an influencer rather than a doer, rather than the person that's got to make the project activity work. Yeah, I mean, you've just, you just sort of opened the door for another line of questioning there, which I, I wanted. It's about the, the suitability of um, I mean, teachers who've been in, in teaching a very long time to actually be a lead person in, in careers um, uh, guidance, I suppose, given that they have taken a particular pathway themselves. They've maybe only ever been a teacher and, and it takes quite a lot of of uh, work to actually be up to speed with what's actually out there in terms of, you know, do we think that maybe that model needs to be looked at? Yes. One of the, I think it's important here to be making best use of the resources and expertise and experience that's in the system. And I think there's a really important role for colleges, for college lecturers and other college staff to work with teachers, schools, parents and young people to raise awareness. And that's certainly the experience of, I would say, all colleges in Scotland. We do as much of that as we can within um, the resources that we have. And there's maybe something there about freeing up the colleges to do more of that because college lecturers are dealing with employers all the time. They understand the industries that they're um, tra training young people for. They understand the needs of employers. So I think it's really important to tap into that. Another thing I think is important is, is, is to be aware that, you know, aspirations vary. And I, and I do think there's a really big job for all of us to do about um, validating aspirations. And, it's, you know, most people's aspirations is not to go to university. And that doesn't mean that's a bad thing. It's not a deficit thing. And I really think that's a critical thing that we need to start doing. And, you know, the reality is that for, you know, when I look at Ayrshire, and I can only speak about my college that I work at, I've worked in it for five years, so the majority of our students, if you ask the majority of our students about why they came to college and, and was it their first choice, they'll say yes. The majority of our students came to college as a first choice. 
and their parents would have seen that as a positive aspiration. Some of our students came as a second chance. They either didn't get to university or they're adults who are returning as a second chance. But the critical thing is that regardless of, it, regardless of it's their first choice or if it's a second chance opportunity, it's high value, it's world class and it's on an equal footing with those that choose to go through universities. And I think there's a really important thing about getting that message out and, and, and using the careers guidance resource across the system to try and tackle some of those negative perceptions. Um, yep, sure. Certainly agree with all of that. And I think that you've put your finger on a very important point about all teachers engaging with this uh, agenda. Uh, I take you in's point that guidance teachers are overworked. Um, and the, the DYW programme board has always been very clear that p the success of the DYW agenda at school level depends on all teachers engaging uh, with, the, with the agenda. And um, for instance, uh, seeing part of the work that they do through the prism of employability. So whether you're teaching biology or English or uh, technical education, part of what the teacher should be thinking is the employability aspect of that. Not in a narrow sense, but in the skills that you're building up for, for people. And I do think that we have got quite a way to go there. Um, but DYW leads in school should be, should be trying to inculcate that sort of attitude amongst all teachers. About teachers perhaps not having a lot of uh, other experience of industry. And in the past, there were opportunities for teachers to have industrial placements, but uh, uh, in the modern times, we're very, very short of backfill opportunities to, so to release teachers to go and uh, see what's happening in a local company is very difficult. I know teachers in the past who uh, had opportunities to go and visit um, local um, uh, chemical works, they, they went out and visited art galleries and worked there for a while. Uh, more recently, uh, we, we've seen some politicians engaging in Apprentice for a Day. I don't know if anybody here has been part of that, but that would be a great opportunity for teachers to go out and be an apprentice for a day just to see what it's like, because <clears throat> that's the kind of experience you can bring back into school and use. There's not very much time or opportunity for teachers to engage meaningfully with employers. You might snatch a few words at, an, at a careers fair, or you might uh, re uh, reach out to people that you know uh, who are employers, but to actually experience it is quite difficult. Now, there are some teachers who've had careers prior to teaching. One of my colleagues was a theatre nurse. Uh, I worked in finance before, another teacher was a chemical scientist. There are lots of people who have had other careers and they bring that into the classroom very successfully. But for those that haven't had that opportunity, I think we need to look at ways of in engaging them in what employers are looking for in young people. You, you can't learn it from a PowerPoint presentation. You need to get out there and experience it, I think. Can we, very quickly, on, on, and this is about employers. And as I mentioned before, um, I taught in college and actually trying to get work placements for students was like the poison chalice of the department because it was so time consuming. And we often found that employers were very reluctant to take on, uh, and that was college students. So I imagine this, it's the same as uh, it's true of, of, of school pupils. I mean, what can we do? I mean, you mentioned some of the things that have been done to try and encourage employers to actually get in, involved. Have any of you had any experience of shared apprenticeship? or shared work experience that allow very small employers to actually share an, uh, an apprentice? Yep. So we've seen in Dundee and Angus some really innovative ways of looking at the work experience programme. I think that's the problem is that if it is a one size fits all, it's a week um, in an employer, it can be difficult because you might get a young person that on day two goes, this is not for me um, and that's not good. So we've seen an employer like GSK, for example, a massive employer, but what they do with that week is they put the young person in different departments so they get to try out lots of different careers. We've got a really strong shared apprenticeship programme that's driven by the college in, in Angus and that is a construction one but it's different construction employers and they might take a young person for four weeks or 12 weeks or six months and that those young people are getting a real good shared experience across a number of different firms but we've got to allow the, the experience I talked about earlier of our school with the timetabling on a Friday afternoon, they allow their young people people to go and find two and a half hours every single Friday from the start of term to the end of term to go to an employer and we had a young person in doing that and that does change their thoughts on their future work paths. Thanks. We are going to have to move on. Richard Lockhead. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Earlier on a couple of the witnesses referred to the challenges facing rural areas and in my area of Murray 
only 16.1% of people are between the ages of 16 and 29, compared to a national average of 18.5%. So we've got less young people. In terms of committed leavers, we have 45% of young people are committed leavers, compared to 40% nationally. So we have less young people, and a bigger proportion of young people want to leave. So it's not a good uh, combination of statistics. So the, in terms of how, when it comes to careers advice, we adapt to local circumstances. How do you take these kind of situations into account without going overboard in terms of steering too far in one direction? Because ultimately it's up to any pupil where they want to develop a career or, or education. Anyone want to have to go at that? Terry? Um, I don't know the specific answer to uh, your local circumstance, but I, I go back to something I, I, I said earlier, which is that each area, each local authority has to address this subject, uh, taking account of their own circumstances, their own uh, demographics, their own um, labour market information, and to try to make the careers advice as, as bespoke as possible. Um, as to the particular circumstances, I, I, I couldn't comment on money myself, I'm afraid, but I, I think that that's how it has to be. It has to be the expertise will be in Murray to address these issues. Okay, Jackie? I mean, it's not quite as stark in Ayrshire, obviously, but we do have rural areas and there are, there are parts of Ayrshire, for example, I'm thinking of Dumellington, where it's challenging for young people to engage in college programmes because of the distance between the, the school and the nearest campus and also the, you know, the, the bus services that are there. So that's, that is a challenge and, and it's one which we're, you know, we're trying to find a way around. Part of how we're trying to deal with that is, is offer more opportunities for us to deliver in the school or with the school. Um, but, but the value of a lot of this is about the young person coming into a different environment, a vocational environment, and, and having the facilities. So it's one that we're struggling with, not to the same degree, obviously, in, in areas like your own. Um, but there's maybe something there, for, I think, I, I know the Funding Council has a view on, on rural, rurality. We don't fall into the rurality aspect of it, but I, I do know there are particular challenges. And the number of young people engaging in vocational pathways from those schools with our college is significantly less because of those challenges. Okay, that may be just an, an area that we need to reflect on as a committee, that there's a whole yeah. area there It's not. Just ask a, a follow-up question maybe to Alison Henderson. In terms of engagement of employers, um, I know more and more employers I speak to are very concerned about skills gaps, and clearly in terms of Brexit, there's going to be even more skills gaps potentially. Uh, is there now a lot of evidence uh, that employers are wanting to work more closely with, with schools uh, to plug those gaps? Yeah, I mean, I think there is. I think you can only see in every regional group in DYW activity that there's employers that are significantly interested in engaging. Um, and I think some of that goes to, to helping young people look at the careers that are in their area and to stay, because the earlier you get that engagement, the more they're likely to look at that employer down the road and say, OK, that might be a fish processing factory, but actually they've got HR advisors and they've got finance people and they've got managers that manage people. So it is about uncovering the local jobs that exist and actually encouraging as many employers as we can to get engaged across all sectors and all size of business. But we're seeing it, yeah. And the final question is, I know making money in life is not everything, but in terms of some of Scotland's most successful entrepreneurs, they do live in rural areas and they've not necessarily had a university education, yet part of the theme and the debate we have here is the pressure that people face to go to university. So in terms of mentors, and opening uh, young people's eyes to the potential success you can have in life without having to go to university. As I said, many of the most wealthiest people I know in Scotland are self-made and they didn't necessarily go to university. Are we putting a lot of effort into having people like that being mentors? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's happening. Again, there's a couple of practical examples. So in Dundee and Angus, we've got an apprenticeship ambassador programme. I know that other DYW uh, um, regions are looking at doing that, but there was a very successful No Wrong Paths social media campaign that came out of Glasgow and, and, and others that showed that you, know, you might not have actually gone to university. I think we do have to seriously get employers to stop putting 
um, degree essential on job applications and person specs because it's not, I don't have a degree, I didn't go to university and yet I've been reasonably successful. So we do have to show people that that is genuinely a path. Um, I would just maybe recommend that you look at, uh, I'm a professional advisor to Scotland's Enterprising Schools, uh, worth a look at their website. Uh, they do fantastic work across the country in developing entrepreneurial skills in young people, um, not just in secondary schools, but in primaries and nurseries as well. And um, they involve entrepreneurs in uh, mentoring and, and helping schools. So it's an interesting website and a lot of information there. Thank you. Jackie. I think the, the GYBU group, along with the college and others, have done some great work in Ayrshire, I'm sure, across the country, and identify employers just like that. For, and, and people like Sir Tom Hunter do great work in encouraging young people. And I suppose one of the advantages we have in a lot of the engineering companies in Ayrshire, they are managed and run by former apprentices themselves who are in as an apprentice, who haven't got university um, qualifications, or if they had, they developed them when they were in work. And they're real inspirations to, to the young people and to our students and young people in schools. And we use them to, to talk about, here's what, I've, here's what I've got to, and here's where I started. And that really helps people identify with that. Thanks. Can we move on? Gordon MacDonald. Thanks very much, convener. Um, when I served on the Education Committee in Session 4, my world of work had just been introduced as a software tool for young people. And I'm just wondering if you have a view on how effective uh, that piece of software has had in better equipping young people to make informed choices about their future. Ewan? Yeah, I used it extensively with my pupils. Um, I, I think it's gone from strength to strength. Uh, when it was first, uh, first introduced, uh, it was fairly basic, but it's now a, a very, very useful tool. Um, it, it's not just a website, it is a suite of tools which is uh, uh, for people of all ages. It's not just aimed at school pupils, but it's something which people can use at any point in their lives, at any stage in their careers. And I think from that point of view, getting young people familiar with it uh, is uh, fantastic because it means that as they move on from school into other stages of their lives, they can go back to it. Uh, and if they uh, have got an online account, they can go back to things that they've stored. Uh, there's a CV builder tool. Um, there's all sorts of um, opportunities for uh, analyze, uh, analyzing your skills, identifying your strengths, exploring uh, employment options, thinking about career changes. There's uh, information about interview skills. Um, uh, there's a lot on that website. It doesn't replace one-to-one -one gains. That's not what it's about. But what it does uh, enable you to do is to have a better quality conversation. So, for example, you might encourage young people, or what I would do would be to encourage young people to uh, look at my world of work, to think about their skills, their abilities, their qualifications, perhaps what they're doing or what they need to do, what they're interested in, and then that would become a very useful conversation starter because you would sit there and say, right, what have you been thinking about? What have you been finding out from my world of work and other sources? Let's talk about it now. Where are you at? Where are you going? What are your aspirations? So I, I think it, it is very, very useful and helpful. Yeah. I just wanted to comment as a parent, as a parent of a young person, I found my world of work really helpful because, you know, my son wanted to do something that I, I didn't know anything about. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I found my world of work quite useful for me to look at, first of all, and think, all oh, right, right, that's, that's how things work in that sector. Mm -hmm. But then to structure a conversation with him yeah, around about that. So as a parent, I, that's a comment as a parent, I thought it was a very helpful resource, as Ewan says, it doesn't replace kind of face-to-face -face support, but it is a useful resource. It identifies kind of career structures within different industry sectors. It relates those to apprenticeship programmes, to HNCs, HNDs, to degree programmes and so on. So I think it is a useful resource. And also, just uh, I, I noticed there was a question about the, the possibility of it creating uh, digital exclusion, uh, and it is optimised for use in mobile phones. So it's something which anybody with access to a mobile phone can use. It doesn't re rely on people uh, having a laptop or a desktop computer uh, or a connection to a wired internet. Uh, it can be used anywhere that you've got Wi-Fi or mobile data. We were talking about the challenge of changing the culture and parents' perceptions, and what you said was really interesting. Um, do you think enough parents are engaging and are aware of, of the website? And do you think the SDS rollout of the ambassador programme of getting youngsters to talk about um, the website to at parents' night, etc.? I know there's about 160 schools have done that. Um, do you think that, that will be helpful in, in raising the, the profile of the website with parents? 
I think these sorts of things have to help to raise awareness. Um, I don't know if you and might have a, a kind of comment on that. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's uh, as I was saying before, it's the experiences of young people that have used it that are helpful. When we're talking about apprentices before, when you get apprentices to talk to young people about being an apprentice, they understand it better. When you get young people to talk about how they've used My World of Work or parents to talk about how they've used My World of Work, then it builds that bit of momentum. People understand how they can use it too. Uh, and yes, I mean, for, for, from my point of view, one of the things I would do with pupils would be to say to them, right, now go home and show your parents this website and discuss what we've been doing here. That would be a homework task. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not something they have to go away and write. It's, a, it's an experience. Okay. Well, one, one of the Gordon, last question. Uh, one of the other aspects of, of the website is uh, the marketplace, which allows employers to use it as a, a matching tool, if my understanding is correct, for work experience, etc. How do we encourage employers to engage more, especially bearing in mind that earlier conversation about uh, small employers you know, being reluctant to take on young people? When we engage with the local cham chamber of commerce, I think, uh, and that was where a lot of the work experience opportunities came from. Um, I'm talking two or three years ago now, though, that I was involved in that, so I haven't got up-to-date information. Perhaps uh, somebody else could pick up on that. We talk about employer engagement with Marketplace. We've seen it be not so popular from an employer perspective. Teachers are, are keen to use it extensively and it works well for them. I think where it works well for an employer is if they know what they want to deliver. So we, when we were looking at our DYW regional group creation, we're saying we almost need a, a menu for an employer. So, you know, I could do an inspirational talk. I could offer a work experience. I could, you know, take a young person in as an apprentice. But Marketplace doesn't do that quite so well as I know I've got um, an hour and a half talk that I could deliver on, you know, chemical engineering. Or, you know, it, so it works very well where an employer's got a very clear thing that they might want to deliver, but where, you know, they're not so sure, it's maybe not quite so obvious to an employer that's not sure what they would use it for. OK, thanks for that. If we can move on, uh, the Leonard Journey Review, Tavish Scott. Thank you, Kavita. Um, just one little bit on world, my world of work um, by way of supplementary. Uh, my anecdotal take on that is not quite as glowing as yours is, I must confess, from, from pupils. So uh, I just wondered to make a specific point or a question out of it. Um, it's all very well if you've got a laptop or a tablet or a PC at home, but lots of kids don't have that or don't have access to it. So uh, can I take it from your answers earlier on that you accept that face-to-face -face, uh, inspirational talks or discussions um, are, are every bit as important as another website that kids are meant to get to. Yes, yeah. definitely, yeah. undoubtedly. Um, and uh, I mean, what, one of the things, that, as I started off by saying today, is that uh, the challenge in schools is that guidance teachers who, yeah. uh, who have that job of being uh, the kind of the, the bringer together of all the pieces of a young person's jigsaw, mm. uh, they, they need every tool that they can find to help facilitate good quality discussion. Uh, and it's important that young people are taking a bit of responsibility themselves. Mm. What you can't do is to force them down particular routes and say, I think you should be a, a whatever. What you're wanting them to do is to look at the different ideas. I mean, um, young, young people that have investigated my world of work have found other ideas. I had one young man who was a, a very keen rock climber, uh, and he decided he wanted to be an aerial rigger. So he was taking his skills, his passion, and his confidence in being at height, and turned it in, and he found that through my world of work. He was an idea of something that he could do that fitted in with his interests. Mm -hmm. Uh, good, thank you. Can I, I, I want to ask a couple of questions, probably to, chiefly of uh, Terry Lanigan, given um, you mentioned at the start that you'd been involved in this area right from the start. Um, and you mentioned specifically the importance of cultural change and, I hate this word, but transformational, you know, so I've just used it, I hate it. Um, uh, the cultural change is necessary in schools. Um, it's about leadership by head teachers, principally, isn't it? Uh, it's about uh, leadership at various levels. Certainly the head teacher has a, a key role to play, as do college principals, but uh, other uh, staff, the, the DYW lead in each school, in each school, uh, individual teachers, uh, I think, have a very important role to play. But there's no doubt that the, the vision of the head teacher and the way in which they choose to, uh, to, to push the DYW agenda is at the heart of this. Yeah. And thank you. And the... Um the point that many committee colleagues have made this morning about um, recognising that many schools still push an academic route, uh, despite what may be said about um, learned guidance, uh, former learned, learned guidance staff and that kind of thing, is still prevalent. So how do you think those barriers have been broken down? 
um, over the last, over the first, what, three, four years of the implementing mm -hmm. this programme. I suppose the first thing to say about that question is that we must be careful that we don't under, that go too far and undervalue the academic route. For some young people, uh, a university degree is the best thing that they can do, and the evidence is still that your uh, chances of uh, long-term, uh, high-quality, highly-paid employment is far higher if you have a, a, a university degree. Mm. So I think it's important to bear that in mind. Mm. Um, the, uh, however, um, I think that one of the pressures that schools have been under for many years is that sort of competitive element around exam results, positive destinations, etc. And I would like to think that the DYW agenda actually moves us to a more collaborative approach where the young person is at the centre. And what we, what, we tr what we try to do in schools is to deliver the advice, guidance, and opportunities that are best suited to each individual. So it's about schools knowing their, knowing the, uh, their, their students and knowing what is best for them. The other aspect is that what might appear to be best at one point in a, in a young person's journey is not always going to be best. I've got a niece who's got a first-class degree in law from Glasgow University. She runs a restaurant mm -hmm. and is very happy doing that. Um, people change their minds, and it's about develop. I think it's about developing the whole person, and about seeing the young person in the round. That's the, that's the key to this. I wonder if I could ask Michael Cross to relate to that question. What is the funding council doing to answer that point about we're target driven in in terms of policy, and is that does the funding council have a role in in breaking that down into a more subtle approach? If I can put it that way. I I, I think. Mr. Scott, you know, we're, we're charged with delivering a series of, of, of objectives by the Scottish Government, and we need targets um, in many instances for that. However, the regime that we operate, uh, and Jackie might want to either uh, uh, confirm this or, or take issue with it, the regime that we operate through outcome agreements is about the relationship between the Funding Council manifesting an outcome manager yeah. and the college, yeah. and that ought to be a consensual, not, not a didactic relationship. Um, so I hope that uh, I, I hope we strike the right balance between ambitious targets uh, that move Scotland's economic and skills agenda forward, um, and giving colleges space to deliver. Mm -hmm. Jacob Gilbreth, do you think the, the, the young person is at the centre of this debate? I think it is, um, but I think that school leaders, college leaders, employers they have their own set of priorities and tasks that they have to get through and it's about negotiating through all of that what resources we can allocate to make this happen so for example we're meeting all all Ayrshire head teachers in a couple of weeks time just to have that strategic discussion because it requires all of us colleges schools and others to free up resource in order to make this successful and you know schools colleges others have got limited resources so the only way to make it work is if we agree shared targets our own shared targets not necessarily just the big targets that come from government what we think is practical a regional um, sense and then allocate whatever resource we can to achieve it and i think that's back, back to the first point that i made really it's that partnership that's critical and head teachers have got an absolutely critical role to play in this and we under in the first two years of developing Scotland's young workforce there was specific funding which i guess all of you would have had some ability to to either be part of or pitch for that went my experience of government policy, when there's no money identified with it specifically, then it's called mainstreaming, and then everyone's responsible for it, and no one's responsible for it. Do you feel it's still working effectively, or should there be dedicated... I mean, um, you and Duncan mentioned the pressure on guidance staff, which is something very familiar to all of us who go into schools all the time. Where does this fit in, along with everything else? I view, uh, Mr Scott, that that, that that has not happened with this particular uh, initiative. Um, the funding was always going to be for two years and people knew that, so it was about setting up, um, testing out certain things. Um, but uh, the programme board has always been quite clear that as far as the school side of uh, DYW is concerned, it's an integral part of Curriculum for Excellence. It uh, goes a long way to delivering the Skills for Work agenda, which is at the core of Curriculum for Excellence. And I think the reason why it has continued to be driven uh, in schools and local authorities is that 
everybody sees the value of this agenda for Scotland's future and for individual young people. Um, I have not heard anyone argue against the agenda that has been pushed by, uh, through the DYW or against the work that the, 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 the Wood Commission um, did. That's very unusual in education. Um, and I think that, that the commitment to that uh, is definitely ongoing, uh, regardless of the, the removal of the funding. Thank you. Final question. Um, we've now got this publication and uh, process called The Learner Journey. How does de developing Scotland's young workforce fit into that? Is there a danger that, once again, teachers see yet another um, big publication coming through, uh, which has got great ministerial import? Sorry, are we not still meant to be doing Scotland's young workforce? How, how do these things fit together? Or do they? I, I was involved in the learner journey work, and um, to me, it's seamless between the two. Uh, any any process which, uh, uh, or any document that tries to describe the process of a learner journey has to take account of uh, the, workforce, uh, the, the workforce aspect of that agenda, uh, the transferable skills that young people uh, should have, and I can see no contradiction or tension between the two. Okay. Mm -hmm. that's, very much, that's very much our view. This is about a fluid system that's focused on the learner. Uh, and resource being allocated accordingly. That's how we see it. Resource. Resource being allocated. Oh, results. Right, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I think this quite clearly ties together the whole kind of, tries to tie together the whole education and skills landscape of which schools are a kind of key part. So it talks about um, more work based learning in the senior phase of school. It talks about how we can shorten learner journeys. Um, you know, so I think it is very much in keeping. It's, it's broader. It's a broader kind of scape piece, but um, it very much builds on, on the DYW agenda, um, quite clearly for me. It's not another initiative. It's, it's part of that broader landscape mm. of education and skills in Scotland, which is vital for our economy to thrive in the future and our people. I get all that. It's just when does hard when do hard pressed head teachers and teachers have time to read yet another publication? And I think that is always the challenge in schools. Uh, we are bombarded with information, and uh, I mean that was a big part of the bureaucracy uh, review. <coughs> Excuse me, that uh, there was simply too much out there for teachers and head teachers to try and read. Uh, and to try and keep abreast of all the new developments. Uh, if you keep it to one side of A4, you might have a chance. Uh, yeah, indeed. Okay. Thank you for that. That's <laughs> what okay. I wanted to hear. Thank, thank you very much uh, for that. Can I thank you all for your evidence today and the great discipline with which you provided it. Um, educators know how to keep to time, which is um, very much appreciated. Um, I'm sure there'll be things that you'll have wanted to say or there's maybe information that you think would be helpful. Just please feel free to um, come back to the committee with any further... I think we spoke, Jackie, about some figures. But any other comments on that you may not have had the opportunity to make during the, the course of the session? So can I thank you very much for your attendance. I'd really appreciate the amount of time you spent with us this morning. And that now concludes the public part of the meeting today. And I'm going to suspend for a few minutes before we move into private session. Thank you.